because we're going to hear a presentation by Peter Bartlett, co-head of the Google Research Australia, established as part of Google's $1 billion uh, digital future initiative. He's also a professor of computer science and statistics at the University of California, Berkeley, where he is director of the Foundations of Data Science Institute. Uh, time allowing, at the end, he may also take some questions. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Professor Peter Bartlett. All right, thanks very much. So, uh, first of all, of course, congratulations for the, for the launch of this uh, AI Institute. It's very exciting. Uh, thanks for inviting me here. Um, delighted to be giving a, giving a talk. I was asked to uh, speak about uh, research in, in AI. This is joint work with Phil Long, who's also at Google, uh, Gabo Lagoshi at Pompeo Fabra, and Alex Sigler, who's at UC Berkeley. Um, in terms of the, the science of AI, when you read about these um, huge successes that, that AI has brought us in areas like uh, natural language processing and computer vision and robotics, and as we're hearing more and more in applications across all of the sciences and, and, and society, uh, a lot of those things are really built on the foundation of deep learning. So deep neural networks uh, have been the, the technology behind uh, this amazing performance. Um, but they're, of course, they're, they, they have their drawbacks. Uh, there are many things that we'd like to improve about, about deep, deep learning. Um, we've been thinking about designing machine learning methods for a long time, and, and you know, many of the issues that, that arise there have their trade-offs. Uh, I guess the fundamental issues, uh, I'll, I'll bring up three. One of them is, is an issue of representation. You know, if I want to use a, a deep network to um, translate from one language to another or to uh, recognize objects in an image, then there's just the question of, do I have with, with that network, does, is, is there some setting of the parameters? Is there some way to represent the, the mapping that I want? Uh, there's a question of optimization. This is an algorithmic question. If I go out and gather an enormous amount of data to, to train my network to solve that problem, you know, uh, am I then able to find a setting of the parameters that in all of these images of trucks recognize that's a truck? In these images of frogs, say that's a frog. You know, it's a, it's a question of um, an, an algorithmic question of efficiently finding a good fit to, to training data. And there's a statistical question of, okay, I've done well on my, on my training set, but now when I go and deploy that system, is it going to be able to recognize objects in, in those images or translate new sentences that have never been seen before? Uh, so these are the issues, and there are you know, all kinds of trade-offs between them. One of the really surprising things about deep learning is that in some sense it breaks the ahead in some sense it breaks the breaks the rules you know there are many surprises that come up um, we're very very accustomed to thinking about rich classes to solve this representation question maybe there aren't uh, the behavior of deep networks is not so surprising there on the optimization side there are some big surprises you know we're classically accustomed to formulating our our uh, machine learning problems as convex optimization problems. You know, it's a family of objectives where we have these tools to very efficiently solve that optimization problem. Um, deep learning methods, on the other hand, use pretty simple approaches, generic approaches, to optimize what is an ugly, non-convex objective, and somehow, in practice, they do that very efficiently. Uh, and you know, I have to say, you know, this is, this is rather mysterious. Um, uh, it does seem to be tied to over-parameterization, to having many more parameters than, than you have in the, in the training sample uh, for one of these learning problems. Um, another surprise ap appears on this statistical issue of, of generalization. And there we're used to being very careful about keeping control of the complexity of the functions that we're, we're using. <coughs> and trading off the fit to the training data to, to the complexity of these functions. In deep learning, you know, all of that statistical wisdom we've learned goes out the, uh, out the window, and, and there's this phenomenon that I want to talk about, talk about today, where these networks can actually find a perfect fit to noisy training data and still predict well. Um, okay, so that's where we're going with this, with this talk. But I thought it'd be good to start 
um, just giving you a bit of a reminder of uh, linear regression. So who's, may, maybe you'd be interesting to ask, who, who learned some linear regression here at UNSW? A nice show of hands, great. Okay, so, you know, it, it's, it's really, we're just thinking about a prediction problem and, and we'll start with a cartoon, you know, rather than predicting from one sentence in English to its translation, we're thinking about, you know, predicting, given some features of something, predict something else. Um, you know, my, my cartoon example is predicting shoe size, okay? So maybe I have some features about a person and I want to predict what their shoe size is. It's a silly example, but it's, it's nice and simple. Uh, and maybe the feature I have is, is height. I mean, this represents the features of uh, a sentence in English and, and the prediction on the y-axis represents, you know, whatever decision I'm making as a consequence of that and maybe that's the translation of that sentence into, into another language. Okay, so uh, it may be that there's a best prediction given somebody's height, there's a best prediction of their, of their shoe size. But of course, that's not enough information. Presumably, there's going to be a lot of a lot of noise around that best prediction and maybe that best prediction is a straight line and you know here's a here's a collection of data you know in this contrived cartoon example of the the the, the light blue line is showing the best prediction given that feature and of course there's some some noise on top of that okay so what if i wanted to learn to make that prediction based on you know what features i have well i would go and get uh, a training set like these these points represent individuals that have a certain height and a certain shoe size, uh, and then I would uh, come up with a, a good fit to that to that training data. Okay, what if I had a very limited sample? Perhaps if I had only two points, right? Two examples. Well, then you might expect to do a terrible job, right? If I had these two points, for instance, right? Then then you know I would come up with a good fit to to that data and I, of course, have a terrible prediction of the, uh, the quantity I'm trying to, to estimate given, given those features. Um, so, you know, the rule of thumb here is I have two parameters, the slope and the intercept, and I'm really making, making full use of those parameters. If I don't have an amount of data that's large compared to the number of parameters, I should expect to be in trouble. Uh, but thinking about just, you know, uh, the, the simple linear case counting parameters, uh, you know, of course, things are much more uh, nuanced than that, and, and in general I should think about, you know, the amount of data that I have compared to the complexity of the prediction rule that I'm using. You know, here's an example of a particularly complex prediction rule that happens to get everything right on that training sample, right, but we shouldn't expect it to predict very accurately, um, you know, as a consequence. Okay, um, in some sense this is the, the situation that we're in with deep, uh, deep networks. Deep networks, it turns out, uh, can be trained to zero training loss, uh, even on uh, um, uh, in, in regression setting like settings like this, but still give near state-of-the-art predictive accuracy, right? Even when we know that there's noise in the in the problem, which is a, a really striking thing. So these these graphs are from work that a group at Google did uh, several years ago now. On the x-axis of both graphs is the level of noise that's been added to the to the training data. On the left, no noise. On the right, essentially complete noise. There's no information in the data about, about the quantity you want to predict. Um, and if you just look at the bottom graph, the test error there is a measure of performance. Small is, you know, down low is good, up high is bad. As we add noise, the performance degrades, but it degrades slowly. That's really striking because every point on these graphs, I mean, the, the top one is, is, is uh, showing this. For every point on these graphs, you're actually getting a perfect fit to that noisy data. So even though we're doing that and we shouldn't expect good performance, we're getting good predictive accuracy uh, even though we've added, added noise. And this has been seen in a bunch of settings. There's none of this classical trade-off that we expect between the fit to the training data and the complexity of the prediction rule that we're, we're working with. Certainly overfitting the data, we know there's noise and we're getting yet, uh, even so we're getting a perfect fit to the data. But that overfitting seems to be benign in the sense that the prediction accuracy is still very good. Okay, so we don't have this trade-off between fit and complexity that we classically expect. We teach our undergraduates, you know, uh, uh, you shouldn't be using uh, interpolating fits of this kind. You know, this is a bad idea, we'll get bad performance, bad predictive accuracy if we do that. And you can find all these quotes from, from the kind of classic textbooks. That's a picture of my bookshelf, by the way. Um, 
Okay, so you know, this is, this is kind of really striking. It's a new statistical phenomenon that deep learning has revealed. And uh, you know, I have to say, even at this moment, we don't completely understand um, uh, how this works. There's been an enormous amount of, of um, investigation of this phenomenon over the last few years. It's been you know, really very exciting direction. Um, the, the point of view I want to tell you about is in a survey paper. The intuition here is for the cases that we, we understand, uh, where this benign overfitting phenomenon occurs, we can break down the prediction rule into two pieces. One that's simple, uh, a simple piece that's simple in terms of classical statistical learning theory. Um, uh, you know, we, we, we really know what's going on. There's a conventional trade-off between the fit to the data and the complexity of that piece of the prediction rule. And one that's, that's complex, um, you know, really think of it as a spiky component that's good for fitting the data, but plays no role in predictive accuracy. Doesn't, doesn't help, certainly, but, but doesn't ha harm uh, prediction. So that's the, the kind of general, general um, uh, intuition be, be behind these uh, uh, benign overfitting phenomenon. Okay, so I'm gonna throw up an equation. They say lose half the audience. Um, but I'll, I'll, I'll describe it in words. This is, this is one of two examples I want to give uh, where, where this arises. This is a classical non-parametric non statistical method called um, Nutteraya-Watson kernel smoothing. And, and the idea here is very simple. If I, you give me a, uh, a new individual with some features, and I want to go ahead and predict their, their shoe size again in my cartoon, um, uh, you know, I have that, that X, and I'm, I want to use the labels of all of the the training examples, just by co coming up with a combination of them, and I weigh them, weigh those labels, those Ys, the, the shoe sizes, according to how similar this new individual is to the, the individuals in my training set. And the way that I compare um, uh, the X, the new X to the, the Xi's, the examples in the training set, you know, involves some sort of a kernel, some sort of a notion um, of, of a of similarity between between those x's. So it turns out, I mean, this is a very classical, classical and simple um, non-parametric method. Turns out, if you work with a crazy uh, kernel, you know, a similarity function that goes to infinity at zero. So as you approach, as you get more and more similar to somebody in the training set, you put all your weight on that on that individual. Then you're going to have a, a prediction that interpolates the the training data. All right, so you have one of these overfitting cases arising, but if you design that spike so that it's really narrow, then it doesn't have much of an impact anywhere um, except right at the, the training examples, you know, and you can come up with a, uh, an example where you can see you're interpolating the data, but it, it, it really doesn't have an impact um, on average on the, uh, all across the, the range of uh, features that you see. So this is work that Belkin, Russell, and Chibikov had showed, you know, even that you could get optimal performance with such, such crazy, uh, crazy kernels. All right, and there, of course, we've got... Okay, somehow. All right, there we go. Um, uh, we, we have this decomposition into a simple piece. Uh, that, that is the, the usual kind of kernel smoothing that, that we do with these things, and a spiky piece that's just due to that spike in the middle that actually uh, plays the role of letting us fit the data but doesn't have any impact on predictive accuracy. Okay, um, and the second example I want to give is, is in the setting of linear regression. So the X's here are these features, the, the, um, uh, the height in my cartoon, the Y is the response. Um, we're making linear predictions, so we're weighting those features in order to predict the response. And we're assuming that the truth really is linear with some noise on top. You know, just like the picture I showed in the cartoon of this linear, linear relationship between uh, height and our best prediction of, of shoe size. So in this case, we can get a, a crisp characterization of when we'll have this benign overfitting phenomenon for the smallest linear uh, function that fits data, fits a training set exactly, what we need is um, some directions. Think of them as features. If we have a, a collection of features, think of it as a small set of features that are helpful for prediction 
and a large set of features that are in some sense, you know, really unimportant. There's very little variation in the data in those, in those other, other features, in those other directions. Um, and, and, you know, that's the same split into a simple piece, this low dimensional piece, and a complex piece that's just good for fitting the data and not, um, not good for prediction but doesn't harm prediction. Um, in some sense, the, our noise is spread across many, many different directions. So this is the same sort of decomposition in the linear regression case. A simple piece, um, the low dimensional piece, and a, and a really complex piece. Okay, um, one other uh, kind of quirk of deep networks that turns out to be closely related is this phenomenon of adversarial examples, this sensitivity to, to perturbation. So this is um, you know, another, another group of, of uh, researchers that observed this, that you can have a deep network uh, for instance, one that's uh, trained to recognize um, uh, recognize images that that produces so, so give it a give it a new example, an image of a panda. It can confidently predict correctly that that that's a panda. But then you can find a small perturbation of that image, um, an imperceptible perturbation, uh, so that the the deep network now, uh, confidently misclassifies this this example, and this is quite a generic phenomenon, right? So there's this huge sensitivity to carefully chosen perturbations to the inputs, a and you know we have to work quite hard to avoid this sort of this sort of behaviour in in practice. So it turns out this is closely related to the um, to the benign overfitting phenomenon in the in the linear case, you know, because in some sense that label noise is injected into our parameter estimates. Um, we're going to be able to find a direction. Uh, you know, don't worry about the, 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 the specifics, but if we, if we have um, uh, good performance in the sense that we're nearly optimally predicting, then it turns out that's, that implies that we're going to have huge sensitivity. So if we're within alpha of the best we can do in one of these linear regression settings uh, with an interpolating prediction rule, then there's this uh, this sensitivity uh, goes goes to infinity as alpha goes to zero. So this is, you know, um, uh, exactly the the um, adversarial example um, uh, kind of phenomenon. So having this benign overfitting leads to that sort of sensitivity. Okay. Um, all right. So just to just to summarize, you know, this. Benign overfitting phenomenon is far from the classical statistical regime where, that we're used to thinking about, where we trade off the, the fit to the tra training data with the uh, complexity of the prediction rule that we're using. In linear regression, we can think about it, we can characterize it quite precisely as um, uh, associated with over-parameterization, with having many, many parameters and somehow uh, having many uh, Um, many unimportant directions in parameter space. So we've got uh, over-parameterization that in some sense has to be redundant in order for the benign overfitting to occur. Um, but uh, as I say, it leads to this sensitivity to these small, carefully chosen perturbations. Uh, there have been some, you know, we've done some work in this direction of, of uh, understanding the same phenomenon in deep networks. Um, the big question there is, you know, are we going to see this same kind of a split into a simple piece and a complex piece. And just to say, you know, why, do, why does this, this kind of scientific question matter? So deep networks uh, rely on this over-parameterization, seems to be an essential feature, um, uh, certainly for this phenomenon. If we could avoid that, if we could find the simple piece and optimize it directly, then uh, we could do things much more efficiently. So, so having uh, this uh, over-parameterization property means that as we go out and gather these enormous data sets to get better and better performance in prediction problems, uh, the amount of computation, the amount of energy that we're spending grows with the product of the, uh, the sample size and the number of parameters. Okay, so that's growing as the square of the sample size. So we're spending a huge amount of energy in training these things when, you know, the prospect is that there's actually something much simpler there that we could be doing. We could have an enormous saving on the, on the energy and still get the same kind of efficiency, um, uh, the, the same sort of effectiveness at solving, you know, all of these problems that have had such a huge impact, but at a much, much lower cost um, in computation and in, 